Hey God, um, we come to you in the stillness and the quietness of this moment, thanking you so much for everything that you have um, so richly blessed us with. Um, I pray that you be with Caleb as he um, brings your message to us tonight. Help us to have open hearts and open ears um, and an open mind to hear what you have to say tonight. And I pray, amen. Hmm. Hmm. This ear right now is kind of ringing a little bit. <laughs> All right. I got a question tonight that I want to ask you, and I want you to think about it. And then I'm going to give you a chance to answer this question. But I want you to think about this seriously. All right? There's going to be times when I'm up here and I ask you a question, and it's going to be kind of silly and kind of goofy, and you might answer it, but you're being kind of silly and goofy too. But tonight, I want you to take a second and answer a question for me. It's a pretty simple question. You don't have to think necessarily real hard. It's not one of those things that you've got to take everything you learned in school today and figure out. But it could be really deep if you let it. Here's my question. Why are you here? Why are you here? Think about it. I mean, I, I know for each one of you, that's, that's going to be answered a little different. And, and in fact, one, one of the questions I asked the praise team first time I met them was, why don't we, why don't we do what we do, you know? But why, why are you here? Like, I just want you to think about it. Why are you here? So think about it. Everybody got their answer. I'm not going to ask you to shout it out, but if there's somebody who would like to answer that question, I want you to. But if your answer is just the Sunday school answer of Jesus, I want you to kind of elaborate a little bit. So why are we here? Anybody want to answer? Parents? Parents. Hey, it's a great answer. That's a great answer. That's, I mean, a lot of times that's why we're here. Our parents tell us to come. Michaela. It's routine? Okay. All right. Hmm? Chicken. chicken? You're here for chicken? Good thing we had chicken this week. <laughs> what else? Why are you here? Need to be recharged. Need to be recharged. Okay. Look out. Getting all super spiritual. Why are we here? This is... The reason I hope we're here, and I know some of you aren't here for this reason, and I'm, and I'm going to talk about why I know that's why... I, you're not here, and that's okay. I'm still glad you're here. But the reason we're here is, and, and if you're not here for this reason, I hope that one day you are here for this reason, and that is to worship and learn about Jesus. To worship Jesus and learn about Jesus. Okay? I know some of you in this room are not followers of Jesus right now. You, whether you've told me that specifically or, or whether I just know because of statistics and a group this size, I know some of you in this room right now if I said, are you a follower of Jesus, in your mind, in your heart, you'd say, no, I'm not. You wouldn't necessarily say so ashamedly. You would just answer that way because that's where you are. You know that you haven't chosen to follow him yet. But some of you have, and I pray that you are here to worship and learn about Jesus. And you may not be, but that's still my prayer for you. So if we are here to worship and learn about Jesus, then I would think the best place to look is... Jesus' own words, right? Um, throughout the Bible, the Word, that's the best place to learn about God and Jesus. And, and, hey, and check this out. Jesus is in the Old Testament. I just blew some of your minds. But Jesus is in the Old Testament. Like, it says we created God in, or we created man in our image. Well, who is our? He's talking about more than just himself there, right? Not just one person, God, but Jesus. The entire Bible points to Jesus, Right? And we talked about this this morning in our staff devotional time. We talked about how in the Old Testament, things hundreds, even thousands of years before Jesus walked this earth, they were talking about Jesus. And so what better place to look than God's Word? But more specifically tonight we're, and over the next few weeks, we're going to look at Jesus' own words, words that came out of Jesus' mouth. Whether you're here tonight, I'm, I'm going to a little sidetrack. Whether you're here tonight because you know Jesus or you don't know Jesus or whether you even believe Jesus was real, even the religions that hate Jesus acknowledge Jesus was real. 
All right? So I want y'all to stick with me because I know, I know in this room there has to be somebody who doesn't believe Jesus was real or maybe you're doubting, but even the religions that hate him believe he was real. All right, so we're going to start a series. I don't know if it's back there yet. It's not back there yet. We're going to start a series on the ser- Sermon on the Mount. All right, so who knows what the Sermon on the Mount was? It was a sermon on a mountain. That, man, that's deep, right? All right, so the Sermon on the Mount is the best sermon ever preached. Why? Because Jesus preached it, right? I just said, like, if we're going to go somewhere, like, if you're trying to find a sermon that really teaches you something, don't go listen to any human sermon. Go read Jesus' sermon. It's the best. Um, So if we decided we're going to dig in, we're going to cover kind of a lot of area, but we're going to go quick. And I I know we're going to be a little late tonight, but that's okay Um, with me. Hopefully it is with y'all too. If we decided to go cover to cover, and I mean cover to cover, and I'm talking fast, I'm sorry. If you, I'll, I'll, I'll slow down in just a second, maybe. Um, if we went cover to cover, cover to cover in the Bible and read every single bit of it, we're going to find a theme throughout. We're going to find a theme throughout. From Genesis to Revelation, there's a theme that we see in Scripture. And that theme is that God is calling out a people for himself. Right? Like he's calling the nation of Israel to worship Him. He has chosen them. And then in the New Testament, he's, he's calling out the church, believers in Jesus. If you say that you have accepted Christ and you believe in Him and you've been baptized and you're following Him, no matter where you are along your walk, whether you're a new Christian and that just happened or whether you've been a Christian for, for 60 years and you're like really close to Jesus, this is it's still for you. To, to, he calls you out to be holy. In other words, he calls you out to be set apart from the world and to belong to him and obey him. Okay, basically what that means is that true followers of Jesus, when I mean true, in other words, you follow Jesus because you chose to, not because your mama or your daddy told you that you needed to go say a prayer. I don't know if that's ever happened, but it's, it's your choice. If you chose to follow Jesus... That means you're a true follower of Jesus. You, you believe in him. You believe what he did on the cross was true and for you, and he forgave you, and you have that relationship. Then Jesus and the Bible expects you to be different. All right, I know, I'm going to slow down in just a second, but I'm trying to get there because I, I don't want, I'm trying to meet time here, okay? So Jesus wants you to be different. Right, like we spend all this time, and, and if you're at D now, Cleve touched on this, we spend so much time trying to look like everybody around us, but we're not called to look like people around us. Like we get, like, okay, perfect example. I always wanted some Jordans. Look, you got to realize, when I was growing up, I grew up in the 90s, 91 to 98, like the Jordan era. He is the greatest. He is the GOAT, right? Like, he will always be the GOAT in my mind. I wanted some J's. To this day, I've never owned them, because now that I'm grown, I'm not going to spend the money on them. And when I was a kid, my parents wouldn't spend the money on them. So, like, I always wanted those, right? But why did I want them? Because my friends at school had them. I mean, I really love Michael Jordan. Like, if I could meet, there's only a few people in this world who are famous that I would, like, geek out if they walked in. And he, he's one of them. Geek out? Do people still say that? No. Okay, that's, y'all know what that means? Okay, well, that's all that matters. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Michael Jordan's one of them, right? There's a few people that I would, I would just, y'all would see me get kind of giddy and act goofy and silly. Michael Jordan's one of them. Not because he's a great follower of Jesus. Maybe he is. I pray that he is. But because, man, I, I had posters of him in my bedroom when I was a kid. And they may or may not still be in my closet at my parents' house. I don't know. I really don't. Um, but my point is, we spend a lot of times trying to look, a lot of time trying to look like the people around us. Whether it's the, it's the style of clothes, the brand of clothes. Like, I started wearing flat bills right when they went out of style. I thought I was cool, and I was told I wasn't. But we try to look like people, and we try to conform to people, and we try to fit in, and we try to be just like everybody else. And when things don't go our way, we're kind of confused, right? Like, we're like, well, I'm like everybody else, and their life seems great. Well, we're not called to look like everybody else. We're called to be different. And tonight, we're going to start the Sermon on the Mount, and we're going to go several weeks um, in the Sermon on the Mount um, because it's that important. We're going to stay in this passage, chapters 5 through 7 of Matthew, for a few weeks. And I hope you all come back every single week, bring friends, so that they can hear the goodness of what Jesus is saying. Not what Caleb is saying, but what Jesus is saying. 
And so we're going to start in Matthew chapter 1, I mean chapter 5 in verse 1. If you don't have a Bible, it will be on the screen, but if you don't have a Bible because you don't have a Bible, I have a whole box full of them. And if we run out of those, I'll go buy some more. I want you to have a copy of God's Word. It's very important. Chapter 5, starting in verse 1. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, that he, that's Jesus, he went up on the mountain and he sat down. His disciples came to him. Verse 2, this is where the Beatitudes start. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Remember, that's Jesus talking. He's saying if people are making fun of you and, and talking bad about, about, about you because of me, you, you will be blessed. Verse 12, rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So let's pray before we go any further. God, we thank you so much that we have your word. God, I thank you so much that we live in a country where we have your word and we can sit here and study it freely. God, I pray that every single person in this room, if nothing else, knows how much you love them. God, I'm, I'm going to pray right now that if, if what I'm, I'm saying is, is not true about your grace and your love and your mercy, that, that we wouldn't keep going. God, I pray that you speak tonight, Lord. And I ask that if there's one person in this room, one person in this room who needs to come to, to faith in you, who needs to for, ask for forgiveness of their sins and repent, God, I pray that happens tonight, Lord. I pray that you're working on them right now. God, speak to us through this. Speak to us through your word. May you be honored and glorified in all that we do. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. So Jesus began his sermon by basically giving a summary of what he was about to preach. You know, like, if you've never preached before or you've never, like, done a public speech or anything, you may not know this, but kind of what you end up doing is you try to, like, have an intro, right? You want to have an intro leading into your big points, right? That's like public speaking 101, maybe. I don't know. That's at least preaching 101. Um, so I took one semester of speech, but a lot, several of preaching, um, and that's what they taught us to do. But the Beatitudes is essentially setting us up for what he's about to preach, what Jesus is about to preach. And so this is his intro, and he's summarizing what he's about to say. Have y'all ever, ever read a book? No, I'm not going to stop there because... Hopefully you have. But have you ever read a book and, and to get started, you look at the table of contents? Anybody? Anybody? A couple of you. Okay, if you haven't, everybody raise your hand anyway. All right, shake it around. Just to show me you're not paying attention. Okay, that's okay. Um, so one thing I learned when I was in grad, grad school in seminary was we had to write a lot of papers and we had to write a lot of long papers. But one thing I learned, I was sharing this, I think, with Bradley earlier this week was my first semester, I was really overwhelmed because I thought I had to read the entire book, and I probably did, but what I did was I, I learned that I could look at the table of contents and find in that book what I really needed out of that book for that paper, right? And so you can't really use this as a table of contents, but just kind of give you an explanation of what a table of contents is. This is it, a table of contents gives you a summary and gives you an idea of what you're about to find out. Right, And so this is the intro, this is leading us up, it summarizes what he is about to preach. And the, what we see here tonight is nine groups, nine different things that, that Jesus addresses, and each one of these things are going to look different than the nat natural reaction. So you kind of see a cause and effect, like he says, blessed are these people for this. Well, a lot of times in life we're going to see that this doesn't result in this. But when we're chasing after Jesus, we're going to see these things. And when we have a relationship in Jesus, how we see life and how things in life happen and how our perspective on life 
changes because of Jesus. Jesus changes everything. Everything. And that should be exciting. We're going to move quickly, sort of. Um, the first thing that we see Jesus say is, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. All right. Who wants to explain what that means? Right. Like, when I... I wouldn't have been able to explain that as a teenager. I would have just been like, oh, that's one of those Beatitudes that my preacher preached about the other day. Like, I do remember one time when I was in high school. I know you, it's hard to always remember the sermons you hear, especially when you're a teenager. But I do remember one time my pastor preached on this, and I remember the Beatitudes. And I just remember what they were called. That was it. So it, it's hard to explain some of this stuff if you don't study it. So that's what I want us to do tonight. So blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The poor, poor in spirit is talking about those people who realize they, needs God, they need God's help. Think about that for a second. The poor in spirit are the people who, who realize they need God's help. If we never, that, like, that's like a big first step, right? Like before you ever repent and ask God to forgive you of your sins, you have to acknowledge you need him to forgive you, right? So like if our four-year-old is going through like this phase right now, where she'll do something she knows she shouldn't have done, and she'll laugh until I give her this look, and then she's like, I'm so sorry, Daddy. Like, right? And why? Because she realizes she did something she wasn't supposed to, and she needs to ask for forgiveness, right? That's our relationship with Jesus. When we acknowledge that, blessed are the poor in spirit, for their theirs is the kingdom of heaven, we're acknowledging that we need a Savior. We need somebody to forgive us of our sins because we fail. So if we never cry out for God to save us, then we'll never inherit the kingdom of heaven. Right? Y'all follow me with that? So blessed are the poor in spirit, because when you're poor in spirit and you acknowledge you need help, you do what it, you need to do to get that help. And when we do that, we repent, and we will one day inherit the kingdom of heaven. You know, and how many people in here are not good in math? <laughs> Adults are like, whew! <laughs> okay, so a lot of us, right? All right. So if you're not good in math and you know you have a test coming up, but you know you need help before that test, and you never ask for help with that test, do you think you're going to make a great grade in that, on that math test, right? So I think I may have said something like this the other day, but a lot of times, like if you're praying for a test, I was told like if you're going to pray for a test, you need to say, God, give me good recall. In other words, help me remember what I've studied. But if you, but if you never study... <laughs> You remember what you studied. Nothing, right? Y'all know what I mean? You know, like if you never studied, it's not just going to, a prayer right before the test isn't going to help you know how to do an algebraic equation, right? That just sounded impressive that I said algebraic expression. I don't know math. I married a mathematician. Anyway, if, if we know we need God's help, why would we not cry out to him? If you know you're sitting in this room right now and you know that you have never repented of your sins, but you know you need to, and you know you're messed up. Hey, we all are. But if you know you've never done that, why would you not? You know what I'm saying? Like, why would you not? Because Jesus loves you more than anything else. And listen to me. And we, we may not go any further tonight. We may. But we may not. I want y'all to hear something. People will let you down. Y'all follow me? Everybody up here. Everybody, everybody up here, I want to get serious for a minute. People are going to let you down. People have let you down. I understand that. Jesus loves you. Y'all hear that? There are people who have let you down and hurt you more than you can ever explain with words because you'll get emotional and start you'll break down. I get it. But Jesus isn't that way. I don't know if it's a mom or a dad or an aunt or an uncle or somebody who was here before me. People will let you down, but God forgives and God don't let you down. Y'all hear me? Is everybody listening? Everybody up here? I'm here because I want you to hear that. Above everything else. God loves you. Jesus loves you. And you're like, well, we know that. We sang a song. But how does our life reflect it? I know you've been hurt. I've been hurt. 
we all have, Jesus won't let you down. God is not going to let you down. The Bible tells us that. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He's not going to let you down. Cry out to him. He wants to forgive you. He wants to welcome you in his family. And you will never be the same. I promise you that. We will move forward for a few more minutes. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted, is what he says next. When we mourn and seek God, we will receive this sense of peace and comfort that only God can provide. I've lost grandparents in my life who I, were, who I was very close to. I mean, I spent summers at their house, and it was hard. I'm talking, if Carrie were in here right now, she could tell you I cried like a baby. We were married when two of my grandmothers died, and, and I, I was shook, man. But God's love and God's comfort provided me something that I've seen other people not have. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Only Jesus can give us that comfort. Only God can give us the comfort that we need. <laughs> Comedy with our friends, people making us laugh, people cutting up. That might ease it for a little bit, but only God's going to help heal those wounds. Next, blessed are the weak, for they shall inherit the earth. Have y'all ever met somebody who's like rough? Y'all know what I'm talking about? Like, like bull in a china shop rough? You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I'm talking the person who, who walks heavy, like they stomping ants constantly, but that's not like them walking. Like they, that's just how they walk. They're just rough, man. They're, they, they even close the cabinet hard, not because they're mad or trying to make a statement. They just close the cabinet. Y'all ever met somebody like that? I'm talking about a person who has zero finesse. Anybody ever met that person? Anybody ever met that person? Oh, Jonathan, is that you? Okay, all right. Well, this isn't about you. I was just trying to make a point. Uh, let's go a little further. Somebody who is mentally aggressive, and they want to dominate you in every way. When you talk, they want you to shut up. And they're going to over-talk you and just get louder and louder, and whatever they have to do, they want to be dominant. Well, that is like the complete opposite of the image we see with meek. Because like meek, like, I don't use that word. Who, whoever says, man, you sure are meek. Like, that's not a pickup line you're going to use to try to get somebody to go on a date with you, right? Meek, that, it's just not a word we use. But the meek are the ones who aren't always looking out for self, right? We know a lot of times that, that person who's that rough tumble, bull in the china shop, who, who's always trying to dominate the situation, a lot of times that's also the same person who's looking out for self. Not, not always, but sometimes. And that's the opposite of the image we see here that I want you all to hear what Jesus is telling us, that, that, we're, that we're not, the person who's meek is not always looking out for self. Instead, they sincerely want the good that God desires. Well, then it, 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 that meek person who, who is actually not this person who kind of makes it awkward around people, it says that meek person will inherit the earth. Essentially, that means that we'll... You'll, you'll be content if you're meek. You're learning to be content because you're not always worried about self and getting the next pair of J's, right? Like, you're not worried about the next pair of Jordans that you're going to get. You're not worried about the next biggest, best thing, but instead you're worried about helping people, and, and it just changes things, right? It changes how we define success, and we inherit the earth because we look to God for the standard, and God will grant it. Like, we need to let the standard that God puts in the Bible be the standard for how we live, not people. Because, like, I mess up. I sin every day. Like, it happens. But God's standard is what we need to look at. We'll inherit the earth. If you're meek, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. We inherit the earth, meaning we're not trying to inherit the earthly things of what I've named on clothes for status and all those things, but instead we're looking to, to praise God and we're looking to glorify God and we're, we're looking to love other people. And so it says you want to inherit the earth. Your definition of the earth will kind of change when that happens. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. This one seems fairly obvious what it means because it says thirst for righteousness. Uh, the people that Jesus is talking about here recognize that the only real source of righteousness or holiness or being set apart or however else you want to look at that 
The only real way of being satisfied in that comes from God and God alone. Not getting asked to homecoming dance by the right person or making captain on the team or, or whatever it is. But you know that the source of happiness and holiness and righteousness comes from God. They're satisfied through their response to follow Jesus. So that's what I was talking about earlier. Jesus loves you and he's not going to let you down. And, and, and if you know he wants to forgive you, why would you not go to him and choose to, to live to follow Jesus? When you do that, it changes you because your, your thoughts start changing. It's not perfection overnight. Remember, what did I say? It's about what? Man, that just made my night right there. It's about progression, not perfection. You're not just going to be perfect. So at this point, we're halfway through these Beatitudes, and we see a pattern that helps us go throughout life. That pattern is found in the theme I shared at the very beginning, that God is calling a people for himself, calling out a people for himself. Like, if you're going to be a follower of me, if you're going to do this, there's kind of this, what you're striving for, right? And he gives us that standard, and we see that. And in addition, we are seeing that true comfort and inheritance and satisfaction comes only from God. Because when you chase all this other stuff, it's just not going to matter. Like, you're never going to be happy. Okay. Last few. Blessed are the merciful, shall, so, for they shall receive mercy. Our motivation to treat people well shouldn't be because we want to be treated well. Now, that's not a bad start. Like, treating people well because you want to be treated nice. Like, well, do unto others as that you would have them do unto you. But if your motivation is simply what can you gain by treating somebody good, that's not what it's all about. We should treat people well out of love because God made them. They're, they're God's creation. Like, this is stuff that most of us are like, dude, we've heard this our whole life, but how has it affected how we live? Do we talk to people that we don't normally talk to? Are we merciful to those people? It tells us that if we're more merciful to other people, God's going to be merciful to us. Matthew 25, 40 says, And the king will answer them truly, I say to you, as you did to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Imagine if how you treated that person at your school who's different than you. What if Jesus told you, is that how you treat me too? Because, like, if I asked that question and asked one of y'all to answer that, you'd say, no, that's not how I treat Jesus if he came in here. But that's kind of what they said to him as well. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. How are you living, like, in your relationships and stuff? Like, oh, that just got awkward. How are you living in your relationships? You know, I, I hear this a lot. I just don't feel God. I just don't feel God. During the worship service and and, and, and camp, and D now, I just don't feel anything. You know, I understand what you're saying, because I've actually been in services before where I've said, man, that, that was not biblical, and like I didn't, I didn't sense anything good there. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about when we kind of want to make an excuse why we don't want to come anymore, and why we want to be like, well, I just don't feel nothing, and I'm just ready to go home, and I didn't like camp, and blah, blah, blah. Well, my advice would start to you with a question. And that question is, are you pursuing him? Like, are you pursuing God? A lot of times we want to put the ball in God's court and question him and question how he treats us, but yet we don't ever talk to him. We don't ever pray to him. We never pursue him except when we're at church and we're really not pursuing him. We're just wanting something to feel good. But are you pursuing him? If you're a follower of Jesus, are you pursuing him? The pure in heart are those who, ha, who are in pursuit of purity and righteousness. The, the, the effect of pursuing Jesus is that you'll see God, ultimately heaven one day. Because if you're pursuing Jesus and you're a follower of Jesus, we know that we will be in heaven one day. It's, it's funny how God works. I've been, I, I had a former student text me this week asking me, he goes to a Catholic school, and, but he's a Christian, he surrendered to ministry, and he had a debate with another student about purgatory and I'm not getting deep off into all this stuff but I'm just kind of setting this up because it's funny how God works we know we're going to receive heaven one day if we're followers of Jesus like we know we're going to be there 
And my response to him was, well, what did Jesus say to, to, to the thief next to him? Anybody know? What did he say? Like, he's about to die. Like, all three of them are on the cross, and they're all about to die. And, and the guy that repented, what did Jesus say to him? Anybody? When? Do you remember when he said he would see him in paradise? Surely when? Surely today uh, you will be with me in paradise. We will inherit heaven. We will be in heaven with Jesus. And, and there's not like a way, like, there's not a purgatory. There, we'll be in heaven. Like, that's what he told him right there. He didn't say, hey, bro, you're going to be in heaven with me, but you got to go to this other place. That was my response. And, and that's, I know that's really sidetracked and kind of ADD, but my point is, it's funny how God works because I was just talking about that, but we will inherit heaven if we're seeking him. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And this is going to be our last point. I know there's a couple more, but I, I just want to end right here. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And if you're a girl, don't take offense to that. Like, this is talking about everybody. Blessed are the peacemakers. Man, I, I, man, I, I hadn't always been a peacemaker in my life. I haven't. I haven't always been go-with-the-flow kind of guy. Just, just ask John. John knows. I haven't always been that person. In fact, when I was a teenager, I had a bad attitude. Quite a bit. And I was involved in church, man. I was on leadership team. I was in praise, man. I, you wouldn't have guessed it, unless you knew me outside of there or on the basketball court. It's only because of God's grace that I can talk about this right now. Because what we try to do when we, when we kind of embarrass ourselves and act stupid, like we want to hide it, we don't want to talk about it, but, but when God works through you and helps you through things, like you, you need to express it because you, you need people around you who struggle with the same things as you do. To, to, you need to help each other. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. I want everybody to stop just a second and close your eyes. Close your eyes, everybody. Uh, even if you think this is lame, close your eyes. Everybody close your eyes. Everybody. I want everybody to reflect on your life since Monday. Don't say anything. Don't open your eyes. Just keep your eyes shut and think about your life since Monday. Has your attitude and actions and attention been more of one that has instigated problems? In other words, have you been starting stuff? Or has it been one that's been keeping peace and trying to stop stuff? Don't say a word. Just reflect on it. On a day-to-day -day basis, on a day-to-day -day basis, on a, on a morning by morning, afternoon by afternoon, at school, on your sports teams, in your choir, in your youth group, the people you're around the most, how, are you one that instigates stuff? In other words, do you start stuff or do you try to keep peace? Do you get mad real easy and want to blow up? Hey, that was me. That was me. I, I, would, I would get mad and, and not know how to handle my, my frustrations and my temper. And it was ugly. I'm just going to be real. It was ugly. What has yours been like? God calls us to be peacemakers. He says, be peacemakers, and you shall be called sons of God. We're, we're going to end the service right now, but I want everybody to just keep your eyes closed and keep thinking, just reflecting over your average attitude. If Jesus were to walk in this room right now, would he call you a peacemaker? Like, this is big to me because, man, I've been there where that hasn't been me, and God has had to work through my life. He has, he has had to try to, he has had to get some things out of my life and my attention so that I could move past this, so that I could grow past this. We're not going to have an invitation song tonight. I know we planned one, but we're not going to tonight. I just want you to stop for a second, and I want you to think about what we've talked about tonight. Are you pursuing Jesus? Have you ever pursued Jesus? Have you ever 
ask, asked him into, into your heart? Have you asked him into your life? Have you, have you chosen to follow him? Have you asked for forgiveness? Have you ever done that? If you haven't done that tonight, I invite you to do that. I invite you to do that. And you know, this, is, this, this gets uncomfortable, but if you haven't done that, everybody, everybody keep looking down. Everybody keep your eyes shut. If you know that's something you need to do right now, I'm just going to ask that you slip your hand up. And you check it. I'm not going to ask you to walk down here and talk to me. I'll talk to you. I, we, we'll, we're going to talk afterwards. But if that's something somebody in here tonight knows that you've never surrendered to Jesus and you have never repented And you need to do that tonight. I'm just going to ask that you raise your hand. Just, just slip your hand up. Anybody else? Anybody else? Look, you're not, you're, you're not going to be wasting time if you're raising your hand because you know you need to get saved. There's nothing else that will change your life like being a follower of Jesus. Anybody else? Look, we, don't, don't look around. We got a couple of hands raised right now, but I want you to look around. But I want you to know there's other people in this room who feel broken like you do. And, and, and they, they know they need to accept Christ tonight. Anybody else? Right on. God will change your life forever because he loves you. Not because you have to be good enough, because I promise you my attitude was never good enough and Jesus started working in my life and he changed me. Look, I'm going to pray for us. And if you're one of the three that raised your hand, come see me, man. I will want, I will want to talk to you. I want to pray with you. I'm, man, it, as exciting as camp is and mission trip is, to see somebody come to know Christ and their life be changed. There's nothing better than that. I will celebrate you, with you. I will pick you up and run you around because that's kind of how excited we get. All right, so let's pray. God, I just thank you so much. God, I thank you for what you've done in my life. God, I know without your grace, there is no way I'd be standing here right now. Lord, and I thank you for that. I thank you for your grace. God, and I thank you for the students who raised their hands tonight because they know they need your love. Lord, I pray that you would give them the boldness and the courage to follow through, Lord, and just begin to live for you and receive that peace that you offer and that eternal life that you offer. And the love you offer, God, we just rejoice in that. Lord, I pray that if there's anybody in here who didn't raise their hand, but they know that's them, and they know they need to, to repent, and they know they need to follow you, God, I pray that they would come to, that, that they didn't have to raise their hand. It doesn't have to be some special time where they raise their hand, but that is an opportunity, God, but I pray that they come afterwards anyway. Lord, we ask that you move in this youth group. God, I pray that you continue to grow this group spiritually. I pray that you continue to bring new people in here so that they can experience your love and your mercy. God, I pray that you would bless the trips that we have coming up, that they would honor and glorify you, and that I pray that we would just grow closer together and that we could just rejoice in, in everything and together and be there for one another when things aren't great, but be able to comfort and help each other along the way. God, we love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen.